1999, a stripper was involved in the creation of a virus that changed the internet as we know it, causing damages of 1.1 billion and affected hundreds of companies, including Microsoft, Intel, and even the US Marine Corps. This is the story of the Melissa virus. The year was 1999, and a quiet New Jersey town called Aberdeen Township was about to host a digital storm that would echo through history. In this suburban community, there lived a man named David Smith, a computer enthusiast who worked as an AT&T subcontractor. He was far from ordinary. His apartment became his fortress of solitude. The glow of computer screens, the hum of hard drives, and the infinite possibilities of the digital universe enthralled him. David Smith was a programmer with remarkable talent. David's fascination with the digital world had roots that stretched back to his growing years. As a young man, he had developed a profound attachment to the world of computers. The logic of software, the intricate dance of code, and the potential of innovation. These were all things that he fell in love with. He had a deep understanding of the intricate and ever-evolving world of software development. While many programmers tried to harness their talents for constructive purposes, David's journey led him down a different path. His exploration of the digital realm turned into an obsession with the darker aspects of the internet. He became captivated by the concept of creating a computer virus, one that would showcase his programming skills, and unknown to him at the time, would help shape the internet as we know it today. On March 26, 1999, the birth of the Melissa virus took place. David Smith, who was 30 at the time, stole an American online account, an AOL account, which is an American web portal and online service provider. Utilizing the stolen account to upload a file to an internet news group named as alt.sex. The post was designed to lure unsuspecting users with the hopes of several passwords to restricted websites featuring adult content. As users fell for it, they keenly downloaded the document and opened it using Microsoft Word. Now, a malicious virus was set in motion on the victim's computers. The Melissa virus was spread through an email attachment, which when accessed, would disable certain protective measures within Microsoft Word 97 and Word 2000. Also, if the user was using the Microsoft Outlook email program, the virus would automatically send itself to the first 50 contacts within the infected user's contact list. If the user didn't have Microsoft Outlook, it would do nothing. Although the virus didn't inflict damage on files or other resources, it had the potential to disable corporations and other email servers. Its impacts were felt across numerous networks, including prominent ones like the United States Marine Corps and Microsoft. The virus infiltrated systems through an email attachment that typically had this as the subject, important message from, and the sender's username. The email's body text contained the message, here's the document you asked for, don't show anyone else. The attachment often went by the name list.doc, or to help entice recipients to open the attachment, they used the names such as sexy.jpg or naked wife, employing social engineering tactics. The virus functioned like a malicious automated chain letter. However, inside the attached file, instead of finding a list of passwords for various websites that required membership, victims encountered a Visual Basic script. The script quietly copied the infected file into a template file used by Word for custom settings and default macros. To describe what a macro is, in the context of computer programs, it represents a sequence of actions that a user could manually perform like typing, selecting menu options, or configuring settings. Instead of executing these actions step by step, macros store them in a single location for automation. Many software applications, including word processors like Microsoft Word, offer the capability to record a series of keystrokes and menu selections, which can then be saved as a file. While this basic macro functionality is useful, it has limitations in terms of speed and complexity for software development. To address these limitations, macro languages are introduced to facilitate more sophisticated macro development and provide control over the software environment. 
However, there are some drawbacks to macros. Firstly, it relies on the application to run, meaning it cannot function independently. Secondly, most macro languages are interpreted, not compiled. This means that each macro command must be translated into code to make it run during its execution, which can introduce performance issues. Programs with extensive macros or those dealing with significant amount of data manipulation may experience slower execution. Macro languages let developers perform tasks such as manipulating on-screen elements and prompting users for input. They empower developers to manipulate and generate files, alter menu settings, import and export data, and perform various other operations. Upon opening the attachment, the infected file was stored on the victim's computer. Additionally, the virus initiated the creation of an Outlook object by means of the Visual Basic code. Scanning the first 50 names within the victim's Outlook global contact list and then sending the same infected document and email to those contacts. Although the virus didn't have a deliberate malicious payload, it did impose a significant strain on email servers, effectively creating a denial of service attack. The primary damages resulted from the disruption of regular business operations as companies were compelled to shut down their services. Many experts in the IT industry said that the situation could have escalated to something far more severe. Reports indicated that the virus was responsible for an estimated 80 million in damages in North America alone and approximately 1.1 billion worldwide. Some approximations suggest that over 100,000 computers fell victim to the virus and 300 organizations reported infections. Notably, a game publisher, GT Interactive, unintentionally spread the virus through a press release. While GT Interactive claimed that Melissa did not cause them direct harm, it did lead to significant embarrassment. According to the Computer Emergency Response Team, CERT, Melissa's impact extended across countries as distant as Canada, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Singapore, Sweden, and the United Kingdom, with one particular company noting that they received 32,000 copies of emails containing the Melissa virus within a 45 minute time frame. During court proceedings, David maintained that he had not coded the virus with the intention of causing harm, believing that any damage would be minimal. He asserted that the virus was intentionally designed to refrain from inflicting harm on computers. But if David didn't have malicious activity in mind, why did he do it? Well, like many others, he simply wanted to see if he could do it. However, he never could have imagined the wide-ranging impact that the hack would end up having. During the chaos, cybersecurity experts and investigators launched a pursuit to find the person responsible for Melissa. The virus's code was impressively complex, leading many experts to believe that it was not the work of one person. Rather, it appeared to be a collaborative effort, suggesting the involvement of multiple programmers. However, they only charge one person. One evening, when the collaborative efforts involving the FBI agents and officials from the American Online, AOL, finally made headway into tracking down the source of the Melissa virus. After carefully examining digital footprints, email headers, and server logs, they managed to pinpoint the point of origin. Their digital breadcrumbs led them to an internet service provider in New Jersey, a significant breakthrough in their investigation. Investigators from the Attorney General's Computer Analysis and Technology Unit took three days meticulously searching the archives of numerous customer files and electronic transmissions linked to the internet service provider Monmouth Internet Corp, based in Red Bank, New Jersey. Their exhaustive efforts helped in the revelation that the telephone line responsible for transmitting the initial version of the Melissa virus was physically connected to Mr. Smith's residence in Abertain Township. As was confirmed by Peter Venero, the Attorney General of New Jersey. The authorities went to David Smith's apartment 
They were armed with the evidence and the digital breadcrumbs that had pointed them in his direction. As they entered his home, they had confronted the quiet man who had unknowingly become an internet cyber criminal. In the dimly lit space, amidst the glow of computer screens and the hum of hard drives, they arrested David Smith. The arrest marked the peak of a digital cat and mouse chase that had taken investigators from virtual realms to the very doorstep of the virus's creator. Smith was taken into custody and his apartment was searched for further evidence. Among the items seized was his computer, which was expected to hold the keys to unraveling the full extent of his involvement in the creation and spread of the Melissa virus. On April 2nd, 1999, when David was arrested, he was charged with interruption of public communications, theft of computer services, and wrongful access to computer systems. He was released on bail for $100,000. On December 9th, 1999, David Smith entered a guilty plea and received a sentence of 20 months in federal prison, along with three years of supervised release. Additionally, he was fined $5,000 and required to complete 100 hours of community service, a judgment given in 2002. At the time, the maximum potential sentence was five years in prison and a $250,000 fine. Nevertheless, the judge took into account David's cooperation with federal and state authorities when determining his sentence. David also faced the possibility of a 10-year prison term and a $150,000 fine for one count of a second-degree computer-related theft, which, imposed, could have resulted in nearly 40 years of total prison time. As part of an agreement to reduce his sentence to 20 months, David initiated collaboration with the FBI, assisting the Bureau in its efforts to identify and catch creators of computer viruses and worms. Initially, he dedicated 18 hours per week to this collaborative effort, later changing to a full 40-hour work week. At this stage, the FBI took responsibility for covering his rent, insurance, and utility expenses, totaling nearly $12,000. During his time with the FBI, David played an important role in the discovery and apprehension of individuals such as Jan D. Witt, the creator of the Kornikova virus, and Simon Valor, the creator of the Goka virus. Something you might be wondering is how was the stripper involved? Well, David Smith revealed that the Melissa virus was actually named after a stripper he had met in Florida. While the Melissa virus itself did not compromise sensitive government data or cause system damage, it served as a stark reminder of the immense challenges faced by the federal government in safeguarding its information technology assets and sensitive data. So, what was learned from the Melissa virus in the early parts of the internet age? Firstly, Melissa highlighted the alarming speed at which viruses can spread in the intricately connected networks. Within a matter of days following the virus's release, infections were reported across the country. What increased the situation was the emergence of virus variants that could evade security software specifically designed to detect Melissa. These two factors combined made it exceptionally difficult to develop effective countermeasures against infections. Secondly, Melissa highlighted the complexity of tracing the origins of a virus. Initially, it was widely believed that Melissa was the creation of an individual using the online name of Vic Odin ES, David Smith, who was distributing the virus from an American online account known as Skyrocket. However, later investigations, prompted by a tip from American Online, revealed that the account had allegedly been stolen. This level of cooperation and investigation was pivotal in identifying David. Thirdly, Melissa demonstrated that vulnerabilities in widely adopted commercial off-the-shelf products, COTS products, can be easily exploited to target all users of these products. This is particularly concerning as government agencies are increasingly relying on COTS products to support critical federal operations. 
These products are designed to cater to a broad market rather than meeting the unique function of security requirements of a specific organization. Therefore, agencies must conduct thorough analysis of the vulnerabilities and threat assessments with COTS products before their adoption. It's worth noting that the Microsoft Office suite using Microsoft Word and Excel accounted for a significant portion of the market in 1997, with an estimated 89% of revenue. Fourthly, Melissa revealed an absence in effective processes at both agencies and government-wide levels for reporting and analysing the repercussions of computer attacks. There was a lack of information readily available regarding the agencies affected, and only partial data was accessible for the Department of Defence and the Department of Energy. Additionally, there was a lack of data at the time increasing the virus's impact, including measures such as lost productivity and the value of data loss. Melissa demonstrated that computer users can play a crucial role in protecting their systems when they are informed about the risks and dangers of computing and are alerted to potential threats. Reports from the media indicated that organisations that had trained their employees and provided warnings about the impending attack fared significantly better than those that did not. Furthermore, Melissa's actions have given rise to copycat viruses, such as PAPA, which is concealed within Microsoft Excel attachments, rather than Microsoft Word. Additionally, there's a Melissa A, which lacks any content in the subject field, leaving users looking for an important message. Concerned authorities now fear that someone might draw inspiration from Smith's action and create an email virus that goes beyond mere annoyance, posing a serious threat, capable of disabling networks and removing computer files. As per usual, the links to all the resources used in the video are in the description. And thank you for watching.